In the first part, we looked at the origin of biological transmutation. In this part, we will explore experiments that have shown what was termed cold fusion and explore the concept of low energy nuclear reactions. A press announcement on the 23rd of March 1989 caused a sensation around the globe. Two electrochemists from the University of Utah claimed that they had observed nuclear reactions at room temperature. Very quickly, the term cold fusion was pinned to this experiment, and yet the two scientists only ever claimed that their observations must have been caused by a nuclear reaction, and that they had no other way of explaining the results that they had observed. Since this time, the term cold fusion has been replaced by the term low energy nuclear reactions, or LENA for short. This field is still considered highly controversial, despite numerous experiments and hundreds of papers clearly signifying that the effects are real. But let's return to the famous cold fusion experiments. The two scientists involved, Fleischmann and Pons, had, four years prior to their famous announcement, had a so-called meltdown experience. They had loaded deuterium into a one centimeter cube of palladium by electrolysis. After months of measurements trying to characterize most of the deuterium in the palladium electrode, it exploded, vaporizing most of the palladium and burning a one foot diameter hole in the table and a four inch deep pit in the concrete floor. They immediately realized that this accident could not have been caused by a chemical reaction. They became convinced that it must have been a nuclear reaction. They then set about redesigning the experiment, changing the shape and size of the cathode, and thereby minimizing the amount of palladium available for meltdown. The electrolyte was heavy water with lithium metal dissolved in it. When the electric current flows through the cell, the water molecules break up into two gases. Oxygen is produced at the anode and deuterium at the cathode. This process would ordinarily operate continuously day and night for weeks until the end of its life. The most critical part of the cell was the surface of the cathode electrode. The excess energy that was claimed would be generated in or near its surface. There would also be a buildup of unknown material on the surface of the cathode that the electricity could not get through, bringing the experiment to an end. These problems have always plagued electrolytic experimentation. Fleischmann and Pons's claim was the detection of excess heat. They did not find the nuclear products that were expected in hydrogen helium fusion. No neutrons or gamma rays were observed either. Since the excess heat effect was very subtle, no one could replicate the results, but the follow up experiments were all rushed, and at the time, none had an accurate description of the apparatus used by Fleischmann and Pons. Their claims were simply dismissed as the expected products of nuclear reactions were not present. This combined with the failure of MIT, Caltech and Harwell to find any anomalous heating effect meant that the experiment was either labelled as a hoax or the result of incompetence of the scientists involved. It was years later that Pons showed anomalous deposits on the electrodes of the reactors they had used. Like many other similar experiments in the next three decades, the conclusions pointed to the fact that transmutation of the electrode had occurred and that it was this that had created the excess heating event. So rather than the fusion of hydrogen and helium releasing vast amounts of energy, instead it was the subtle rearrangement of the metals in the electrode which had released energy and formed the unknown substance on the electrode. Mizuno's experiments differed from Pons and Fleischmann's in that it was run at around 10 atmospheres of pressure and much higher power densities. In one of the events he describes that an anomalous heating event occurred and he struggled to remove the excess stored energy from the experiment. In the end he estimated that the excess heat amounted to as much as 100 megajoules. He also noted the appearance of new elements that were not there before the experiment began. He detected large amounts of chromium, iron, manganese and copper in the post-analysis of the palladium cathode. These cannot be dismissed as coming from contamination. Another issue shows up in the exposed cathode in the form of changes in the ratio of the six stable isotopes of palladium from the naturally occurring abundance. The exploding foil experiments. These experiments were conducted back in 2002 in Moscow. 
a thin aluminium foil was exploded underwater using electrical charge. It too seemed to create new elements that did not exist before the experiment. The new elements included aluminium, silicon, calcium, chromium, iron, nickel, copper and zinc. And there was also changes in the isotope ratio for titanium in the aftermath of the experiment. His experiment seemed to show a forced disintegration of an element through the electrical discharge. Pieces of atoms were ripped off and refused to bigger pieces in a somewhat chaotic process. These experiments were conducted by Iwamura at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. These used a multi-layered substrate of palladium and calcium oxide. On the surface of the substrate they placed atoms from a given element. Deuterium gas was passed through the substrate. As the experiment progressed, the given element is seen to decrease in quantity and an element which was not present before the experiment slowly appears on the surface and increases in quantity. They have repeated this type of observation many times with several pairs of elements. The Sapphire Project Sapphire stands for Stellar Atmospheric Function in Regulation Experiment. Its main goal was to test the electric sun model as part of the electric universe theory. The project was given the go-ahead in 2013 and the first prototypes were constructed in 2014. These tests revealed self-organizing plasma double layers. These also revealed that the shape of the cathode did not play a significant role in the formation of the plasma double layer. These initial experiments also revealed through optical spectroscopy traces of new elements. They also observed anode tufts as well as high energy trapping electrons, ions and molecules. These observations led to the design of a much bigger reactor for phase 2. In 2017 the first big surprise was the melting of the Langmuir probe and the subsequent changes to the structure of the material. This initially raised concerns about the cooling system for phase 2. This led them to conduct high energy plasma discharge experiments and the analysis of the impact of various gas compositions to try and understand plasma double layers at the atomic level. This led to the discovery of dark mode plasma structures. Pushing ahead in 2019 they started to test the thermal limits of the chamber. New gas compositions and anode alloys were introduced to try and understand these dark mode plasmas. During one of these runs the anode suddenly melted and the thermal limits of the chamber were reached, with just 7% of the maximum energy input. They immediately had to shut down the machine. Later analysis of the anode revealed the presence of elements that were not present before the experiment. In the next part we will attempt to try and understand what is going on in both the biological transmutation and these experiments using the structured atomic model. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.